Catherine Boone, property and the political order in Africa. Sounds like a repeat of the old enclosures, a land grab in a continent on a massive scale. True? There is a land grab going on in sub-Saharan Africa right now. Um, and that is part of what makes the study of property in Africa so compelling right now. But the political order referred to in the title of the book that uh, you mentioned is the existing property order that links uh, small holders, farmers and herders yeah. to the land and to the state. So I refer to the existing property order in Sub-Saharan Africa that organizes land use. Right, but those guys have relied on ancient title, community rights, etc. And now they're finding, as far as I understand it, that they're being sort of swept away by a combination of forces that are beyond their understanding. This sounds like a shocking, shocking example of plunder. I would say the existing status quo, the, the existing order, is not an ancient, mysterious one. It's a system of property rights and property regimes established by the modern state in, the tw in 20th century Africa. Mm. So this has created a certain kind of political order in sub-Saharan Africa in the 20th century. And it is this that is jeopardized by the land grabs that you referred to. And it's backed today. by the state. Is it backed by the state often? Backed by the World Bank? It's driven by ideology, property. Is that true or is that an unfair caricature? Well, it, it's half true. Um, the transformation of property rights in sub-Saharan Africa right now is part of uh, demographic change. It's part of institutional change. It's part of Africa, 21st century Africa. So the question is how to modernize and evolve property rights in ways that protects mm. the assets of the people who are in place and in a way that promotes development and promotes security and peace for people but who are there. You could say kind of cruelly, well, they're yesterday's people. You know, private property is the engine of capital. Sure, a bunch of people in England and Scotland didn't like it in 1810, but now look at how wonderful the countries are. This is the price of progress, a few short-term tragedies. Well, a pr progress by uh, massive dispossession and immiseration of people will only, it won't be progress, it will breed and misery and violence. Mm -hmm. So really it's the opposite of, of what, uh, what anyone interested in order or progress or development uh, would be interested in. So the challenge is to have an orderly processes that promote uh, development and security and good environmental management and a political order in could, sub-Saharan Could you have Africa. both though? Could you have both? Because in a way it's a big place and surely there's room, as it were, to develop these sort of land pushes and yet retain a community commitment to ancient rights? You know, only 25% of all the land in Sub-Saharan Africa is available for agriculture, is arable land. And all of that land is claimed. All, every inch of that land is being used by someone right now. So there's really no sort of open or ungoverned space that is available for seizure by someone else. Every land transaction, every transfer every conversion of use needs to be negotiated with existing land right. users. Right. So what would you do about it? Here you are writing this book and you're ranged against the huge forces uh, combining. How, how can you address that? How can a writer address that? What's your, what's your prescription? I think from the perspective of social science, the first step is to, to understand the status quo and to understand the existing system of rights. So who who controls what, who's using what, and under what political arrangements. So this is the kind of basic knowledge that will inform policy and will inform uh, strategy for moving forward in ways that allow policymakers and people in Africa and civil society groups to figure out uh, sane, fair, uh, just, but they and developmentalist ways for but, moving forward. But they know already what's sane and fair, they just fancy grabbing the land. It's not that they are immune to reason and once they know about it, they've changed their ways. They're happy, they're grabbing. It's selfishness, it's not reason. Well, the they I think you're talking about right now when you talk about external land grabs are uh, multinational the corporations yeah. and investors from the United States and Canada and Saudi Arabia. And actually they're not grabbing directly they work through African governments. And so African governments have adopted a wide variety of strategies, some 
uh, have given land or leased land to foreign investors without any regard for the rights of people who are in place. But some African governments have been very careful and progressive in trying to negotiate good uh, partnerships that allow people who are using the land right now to also benefit. Do you sometimes feel, as an academic, you know, writing the books and so on, that you'd be better occupied as an activist out there fighting? Do you think there's really a connection between the kind of work you do, or indeed any academic does, and change, progressive change? You know, I think that's kind of like asking a doctor who works on um, molecular, cellular research whether what they have to do has anything to do with fighting cancer. You know, we really need the basic knowledge. You have to know how things work and what the status quo is before you can uh, begin to imagine progressive interventions that will uh, maintain what's good about the status quo and move forward incrementally in ways that keeps the peace and uh, enhances people's livelihoods and builds political stability. Catherine Brayden, thank you very much for subjecting yourself to the Gear to Grilling. Thank you for inviting me.